really true and honest. We are very glad that you accepted in short time uh, the invitation to come to Madrid and discuss with us your book, but probably also the broader interest in Shira and, and our own reflections on violence and religion. So we are very glad that we have Bankai Mishra with us. I will just introduce him a little bit, a little bit broader than the usual introduction, but I will do the usual too. So Bankai Mishra is a person who lives in between India and England. He studied commerce and graduated with a Bachelor of Commerce from the Allahabad University in India and then completed a master in English literature at the Jawaharlal Nehru University in New Delhi. He wrote already quite some books, one of them except the book we discussed today, Age of Anger, An End to Suffering, The Buddha in the World. And he is also very well known globally because he frequently uh, contributes to the New York Review of Books. He contributes in New York Times. Currently in the German-speaking world, you cannot buy a newspaper without a review of his book or an interview with him or an essay with him. So it's all over the place. And I heard also in other languages. Let me tell you just in two sentences, and then I will come to a first question. Uh, I came across uh, Bankai Mishra's work not because of Shira, and quite early on I was going to India in 2004 for three weeks with a small group to visit parishes and missions and Jesuit uh, locations there. And in order to prepare, I read uh, some novels. I read novels by Naipaul, and, I, and the first thing I read in order to go to India was Kipling's novel Kim. And the new edition of uh, the novel Kim has an introduction by, by Bankai Mishra. So uh, that was the first time that I read, his, uh, read something of him. And then I frequently read his articles in the New York Review of Books. But I was struck, and that now leads already to mimetic theory and René Girard. Uh, you know, I'm a really follower of Girard, and uh, one of the criticisms about my book, and it's just this, there is no critique in my book. And I didn't have a lot of critique, and most of the criticism uttered over against Girard is not worth to reflect on. But Bankai Mishra criticized Girard, uh, criticized and also showed uh, 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 the, the good side of Girard in two, 2005. And very often I tell people, well, Bankai Mishra uh, had uh, uttered a criticism that we should take seriously. So I just want to introduce to you, in 2005, Pope Benedict became Pope. And uh, American Journal, the New Perspectives Quarterly, uh, interviewed René Girard, Nathan Gardels, interviewed him, and the interview was published with the title Ratzinger is Right. So that was the title of the interview with Girard. And in this interview, of course, he sided with Ratzinger because of Ratzinger's clear stance over against relativism. But he also made the stance that uh, ultimately, we have to see and understand Christianity is superior. And in the same issue of New Perspectives Quarterly, also Bankai Mishra was interviewed, and I think you had the chance to read uh, the interview with Girard also. And Bankai Mishra expressed his uh, admiration of Girard's insight into the nonviolent message of the gospel which he recognized as a significant source of inspiration for Mahatma Gandhi's political spiritual vision. And then he expressed the criticism uh, over against Shuar's emphasis of the superiority of Christianity. Bankai Mishra said, I wonder if it's not more relevant 
to try to find traditions in Buddhism, Hinduism, Islam, which chime with the truth of the Gospels instead of claiming superiority. So when I read that first said, well, this is something we have to take seriously. In, in, that was in 2005, now 12 years later in November there will be a book coming out, Mimetic Theory and World Religions, and in the introduction we refer to your criticism, so it took us 12 years to give a first answer to your request. <laughs> so, so my first question, and uh, we will go to and forth, my first question, because I think that's a question many of us are interested in, how did you came across uh, the work of René Girard, so what was the first occasion you read it and how did it develop to uh, uh, play such an important role in your recent book, Age of Anger? But first of all, thank you and thank you for inviting me. Is this working? You can hear me, okay. Um, very, very pleased to be here um, because Girard has actually played a, a big role in the framing of this book, but also generally in thinking through a variety of issues over the last decade and a half. Uh, I came to him really through his literary criticism in the first instance, and then discovered that he had this other side, uh, which he had developed in the 1970s and 80s, um, almost a kind of systematic theory and began to see its relevance to the things I was very interested in at that time, specifically the evolution of up here. Thank you. Much better, yeah. The evolution of post-colonial societies in the last hundred years, starting with anti-colonial movements, then their development into post-colonial states. And I began to see the enormous relevance of uh, mimetic theory to this, to this massive, I think the central historical development of the 20th century, which is decolonization and the formation of um, nation states in, in, in Asia and Africa. So that was one um, instance where I, 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 I could see there was a lot to be gained from um, applying this, this, this theory. But I think, uh, you know, returning to your question about Gandhi, for instance, I feel that, you know, someone like Gandhi was acutely aware of the sacrificial mechanism. And for one reason, this figure of the victim and the prestige of the victim that he built up, that was his big weapon against the power of British imperialism, that uh, the victim acquires a kind of moral prestige by not retaliating, by not responding, um, and that the victim is innocent. That emphasis um, is really, in, in many ways, at the core of Gandhi's thought. And a lot of this he derives, I don't know to what extent he was conscious of it, he has written about it, obviously, um, from the Gospels. Uh, it, it's, it's impossible to conceive of Gandhi, to conceive of Gandhian thought without the role played in it by his readings in Christianity. And many of them were eccentric readings. You know, this is a self-taught man, um, like, like many of us, who, who comes to Christianity through all kinds of different ways, through Tolstoy. Uh, there's a sort of anarchist Christianity of Tolstoy, which is very intriguing for, for, for Gandhi. But nevertheless, he draws from it um, these particular lessons, which he then applies to his political method which turns out to be an extremely effective, a very original way of being a political activist, mm -hmm. uh, combining it with a spiritual program. Mm -hmm. So I began to see again, I mean, you know, obviously Gandhi was not an intellectual in the way we think of intellectuals <coughs> today, but he had an instinctive understanding um, of a religious tradition. And at the same time, he was not willing to, there's a very interesting correspondence between him and Christian missionaries. 
about conversions in, in India. He's very, he was very much against conversions mm -hmm. because he thought that uh, people ought to be faithful to their particular cultural religious traditions that they are born into and that whatever they gain from it, if they are truly spiritual, if they are truly religious, will not distract them, will not detract them from the pursuit of truth. Um, so he refused to say, for instance, that Hinduism is superior or, or, or uh, for that matter, any religion is superior to, to, to others. Um, he was very much interested in, oh, this is not working. He was very much interested in, 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 in sort of looking at different religious traditions and combining um, the best from, 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 from all of them. Uh, so very much a kind of, in, in, in a way, the inventor of traditions too. Um, even within Hinduism, he was looking at particular, particular traditions and rejecting the others. Uh, I think it's in, is interesting how he responds to the role of war and violence in, in, in Hinduism, how he d seeks to diffuse that mm -hmm. uh, particular element. But anyway, um, I think to come back to Jura, I think, and to this book, the, the recent book, I had really only thought of him in connection with the project of anti-colonial nationalism as a kind of mimicry. Mimicry is a very important theme in much post-colonial thought. The, so the, the most important book I've, I think about, Indian nationalism, for instance, is called, is subtitled, A Derivative Discourse. This notion that you have to imitate to, in very close detail, the oppressor, the entity, the nation state that has invaded and occupied your lands, that has managed to accumulate a kind of power, an unprecedented kind of power through technological means, through global capitalism, and that you have to enter, you have to embrace the same rules, you have to embrace the same methodologies in order to survive with dignity in this sort of doggy dog jungle of international relations. Mm -hmm. That is a very powerful theme mm -hmm. in, in, mm -hmm. in international relations, which also clarifies many of the dilemmas of post-colonial nationalism when that anti-colonial element diminishes. How does that anti-colonial nationalism define itself? And we are seeing the problems today mm -hmm. uh, where internal enemies are being sought. Uh, so the scapegoat mechanism is, is, is kicking in, uh, in in all kinds of unpredictable and, 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 and chaotic ways. Mm -hmm. uh, but thinking about this book made me expand my <coughs> frameworks a bit and, 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 and made me think of a larger history, a history of the modern world, no less, starting the late 18th century, but more importantly, the early 19th century, as a process of mimicry, sometimes very, very self-conscious, mm -hmm. starting with um, Napoleon and his conquest of various European countries and the feelings he evokes in the peoples he has conquered of envy, of ressentiment, and the ways in which those feelings become politically potent which is true as much of Napoleon in Egypt as Napoleon in Germany. Mm -hmm. And when I started to think in those ways, a whole landscape opened up where I could connect uh, not just post-colonial Asia and Africa, but also much of the experience of modern Europe in the 19th century. And I could see Girard's insights being, being, being verified um, across this much broader swath of mm -hmm. history. Mm -hmm. Okay, maybe uh, just follow up a little bit on Gandhi first. You said uh, that uh, Gandhi's reading of the gospel influenced him to come to a new understanding of Hinduism. I very often say to my students when they make uh, two simple juxtaposition of jihadist, jihadists on the one hand and nonviolence of Jesus, that I said, go back 70, 80 years ago, and if you would have talked about a nonviolent Jesus, uh, many Christian Catholics wouldn't have really understood what you are talking about. So that my feeling is, 
the work of Gandhi also influenced the Catholic Church dramatically to come to this understanding that we uh, teach today when we talk about the importance of nonviolence in Jesus. But uh, uh, I, I just want to continue a little bit on Gandhi. It's not, I think, in the book, but uh, you also wrote a very important essay after the, after the Charlie Hebdo terrorist attacks in the English uh, newspaper Guardian, and you said, we need a new enlightenment. And part of this uh, new enlightenment, you uh, uh, say it's so important, and I, I mean, this idea is also throughout the new book. Uh, you, you, you refer to Gandhi and you quote Gandhi and, say, and, and you claim, or you say, whoever claims that, relig that religion has nothing to do with politics doesn't understand politics and doesn't understand religion. Could you uh, explore that a little bit? Because I think for many Western, <laughs> Western liberal people, this, this is probably something that's difficult for them to swallow. Sure. I mean, not maybe for us, because many of us have uh, uh, religious affiliations or are f on friendly terms with religion, mm -hmm. but for the Western European uh, educated people, they, they have finished in some way with religion. So now you come and say you have to focus on religion. To us, yes. Let me reposition my chair. Yeah. Okay. Um, that's a very important question. I mean, in many ways, what we're seeing today around the world is a cry of anguish. Um, you can interpret it in any, any, any number of ways, but what we are looking at is, is, a, is a large protest against a world in which the pursuit of individual self-interest has created societies with obscene extreme inequalities where all kinds of ethical codes have been flouted with ample rational justifications that you know this these particular cults of economic growth of gdp that we've invested in which are our kind of have been substitute religions, particularly in the last three decades or so, where um, economists, technocrats, experts devise schemes of universal fulfillment, universal progress, and peoples around the world follow those schemes. Now, someone like Gandhi, who senses very clearly that this is the world in many ways that we are beginning to live in. You know, he, he, this is a man who experiences globalization in his first phase in the late 19th century. He sees it, he witnesses it. He's in South Africa, he's in England, he's in India. He has a unique vantage point on these massive socioeconomic changes that are beginning to royal Europe. Also, we are beginning to experience that kind of change in Asia through imperialism. And he sees that Politics has become increasingly detached from all kinds of ethical concerns. That this is about the pursuit of commodities, about resources, about territories, about national self-interest, individual self-interest, or organized selfishness, as, as, as Rabindranath Tagore, um, another Indian who should be spoken of in connection with Gandhi, said. And his really, his entire program, his political program, is to recombine politics with a religious project, with a spiritual project. Very broadly speaking, an ethical project. You know, so when he says that those who talk about um, religion or those who say that religion has got nothing to do with politics, no neither politics nor, nor religion, He's basically saying that um, politics, when it is disconnected from ethical codes um, that have actually governed human conduct for, for centuries and centuries, then we are going to look at monstrous wars, we are going to look at um, 
incredible conflicts of oil, Gerard would say, escalation to the, to the extremes, that we need uh, very much to incorporate the ideas, the values, the ideals that have been central to human lives for, for a very long time. That it is only in the modern era that we have abandoned them and even seen virtue in abandoning them, even seen progress in universal secularization, in a large scale rejection of transcendental authority, in fantasies of creating the kingdom of God on earth through science and reason and, and, and commerce. So I, I think Gandhi is, is very much, I mean, probably the most harsh, the most eloquent critic, uh, in that period at least, of this tendency in, 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 in the modern world, and a very prescient one too. Mm -hmm. So, but uh, if someone today in the modern world claims there has to be again a connection between religion and politics, uh, the alarm clocks uh, by some people go on, there, there is alert because there's already the danger of fundamentalism on the table. So in, in, this, in your essay you make also the claim we have to retrieve the enlightenment as much as religion from its fundamentalists. So you claim fundamentalism is a problem and there is religious fundamentalism but there is also an en enlightened fundamentalism, right? Absolutely. I mean, I think we are looking at both. We have been looking at both. Um, religious fundamentalism, I've argued many times, is a symptom of the decline of religion. I think this should be understood uh, very precisely, that it should not be taken as an aggravation of traditional religion. It is, in fact, a sign that traditional religion is in rapid decline. Not surprisingly, Islamic fundamentalism, Hindu fundamentalism, Buddhist fundamentalism, we, we, we are seeing some oxymoronic uh, developments today. So Buddhists have turned ethnic cleansers, militant nationalists. That is always invariably a sign that Buddhism is in decline or Hinduism is in decline, that the hold of older ideas of transcendence have more or less vanished. And people who are left desolate by this disappearance of all that made life meaningful for their parents, for their grandparents, are desperately trying to recreate some source of authority in their lives. And therefore, the, the kind of fanaticism they bring to this endeavor that they can only really define themselves by through violence, through persecution of some minority or other. You know, this phenomena that we're seeing of Shia Sunni, for instance, this is very much an attempt to create an existential identity for yourself through persecution, through violence. Mm -hmm. And this is really how we should understand fundamentalism rather than connect it to something Someone said in the 13th century, 14th century, our discussion of Islamic fundamentalism, I've been arguing over and over again, is intellectually puerile. Uh, I could use harsher words, but it really is not only politically counterproductive, which we have seen over the last <coughs> decade and a half, but intellectually catastrophic. It simply does not understand that traditions simply do not exist in some unmediated, form that you can simply connect yourself to, that you can simply connect yourself to some theology or scripture from the 15th century or from the, from the, from the 8th century. That religion is a dynamic force, is constantly shifting, changing, interacting with wider realms of politics, and especially in the, in, in, in the modern world, uh, religions are constantly being secularized. And, and, and what we are lo really looking at is a symptom of universal secularization mm -hmm. when we talk about fundamentalism. Mm -hmm. And likewise with uh, the more secular forms of fundamentalism, the more blatant forms of fundamentalism that we've seen since the late 18th century, which really in a way are trying to 
create substitute religions by upholding such goals as progress, uh, science, commerce, uh, universal trade is going to bring us peace. You know, these are the investments that are made in the late 18th century, very, very consciously, mm -hmm. um, that uh, this is the clue to uh, being a cosmopolitan citizen. This is how we, how we do this. And in, in many ways, what we are looking at today is the end game of that project, uh, a, a, a long drawn out end game a project in which the individual, his desires were exalted above all, uh, where humanism of a certain kind was privileged over all other ways of being in the, white, in, in, in the larger world. And the fantasy of individual reason, of the individual self to begin with, as a coherent entity. All of these things that you know, were first formulated, theorized, and then institutionalized throughout the 19th century in our, in our politics, in our, in our economy, uh, what we're seeing today you know, in this global landscape of, of rage, of, of disaffection, is really in, in a, a kind of worldwide challenge. To, to these ideas. And, and that's why I argue that we need a new enlightenment. Uh, we need to emerge from this immaturity that these fantasies of individual reason and, and, and faith in science and faith in commerce have, have plunged us into. Mm -hmm. If I would uh, market, and I do it now, market your book, really promote it, I would say the, the, the probably two most influential books after the end of the Cold War were Francis Fukuyama's End of History and Samuel Huntington's Clash of Civilization. I would today say you should rather read uh, The Age of Anger because The Age of Anger responds to both of these books. And probably we can just shortly follow up both these challenges. I think the uh, you start in some way in the age of anger with a challenge of the worldview that is comprised by Fukuyama's end of history by showing that the anthropological view of how human beings are is false in this uh, version of Homo economicus uh, and overlooks passions, anger, resentment, that we have to understand better in order to understand our world. Is that correct or can you explore yeah, you know, a little I bit? I mean, I think, you know, uh, one, many things I didn't say in the book, but it's important to understand both end of history or clash of fundamentalisms um, that, that both come from individuals, from writers, very close to the American establishment. Uh, in, in one case, actually an employee of the State Department, uh, mm -hmm. Fukuyama, Huntington, a classic uh, kind of advisor to power. Uh, intellectual scholar. And so whatever they write cannot be detached from foreign policy, military imperatives of the United States. So that in itself deeply compromises uh, whatever they have to say uh, about the state of the world at large. In many cases, the end of history was a kind of uh, Hegelian fantasy that the state of equilibrium that the United States had arrived at in the post-war period with a heavily commercialized economy, an expanding economy, uh, with people apparently content with material pursuits of all kinds. And of course, you know, living in a kind of material planet plenitudes, uh, technology, creating new objects for consumption, all the time, that this state, this peculiarly American state can be generalized around the world. And since it is so attractive to Americans, it will also be attractive to other people who will aspire for it. This is partly right. Uh, but you know, many things were completely um, either obscured or ignored in this whole fantasy that many people are not in a position to aspire for those things. Temperamentally, historically, their countries, their societies have not been privileged in the same way the United States was to aspire for those things. So that aspiration, that 
pursued, that struggle might end in frustration, which might turn politically toxic, as we are seeing today. Mm -hmm. uh, this is one thing quite, a, you know, the, the other thing is that many people have other ideals, have other values, that not all of them can be theorized, can be seen, or can be made to conform to this anthropological image of first theorized in the late 19th century by slave owners in America and some upstart networked intellectuals in, in, in late 18th century France and in England. Why should we assume that people around the world at different stages in their historical development with different cultures, different traditions, would want to be like the man Adam Smith thinks everyone should be? Why did we even entertain this fantasy? But nevertheless, here we are. Mm -hmm. uh, much politics, much economy, much uh, 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 work that is carried on by international organizations, United Nations, state governments, assume that this is the case. Well, it turns out that is not the case. Now, when we move away from this end of history narrative, um, the response to that is, oh no, history is not ending. We are entering a clash of civilizations. That is another, I feel, um, uh, another sort of slate of hand where you posit these large civilizations which are internally very different, you posit a kind of clash. And beneath all that is a kind of racial anxiety, which is very clear in Huntington's last book, that we white Anglo-Saxon Protestants are being swamped by these darker skinned immigrants which you now see, of course, uh, now it's being bluntly stated by our, all kinds of white nationalists in, in, in the United States. But I think, again, I mean, these really, these books are important as symptoms of particular anxieties, of particular fantasies entertained by, by powerful people. And of course, they circulate, they acquire uh, a kind of international reputation because of the cultural, political power of the United States. And of course, the networks of publicity, advertising that, that, that go into making them important books. But you know, I feel intellectually, they are, they are really level, operating at the level of fantasy. Mm -hmm. uh, one can read your book, I think, as a justification of, left -wing, of a left-wing critique of neoliberal globalism. Uh, we, we discussed in a small circle a little bit uh, about your book, so I, I express now a concern and would be interested how you react on that. Uh, you very much draw also on Tocqueville and on this phenomenon that equality is spreading, but uh, the, the hopes that equality raises are not fulfilled. So one could probably read your book as saying it's a problem of distribution. So if we distribute uh, globally the goods on the world so that everyone has he, its or her share, everything would be solved. We Girardians and Girard in his very first book also draw heavily on Tocqueville and said we have to recognize that the more there is equality, the more there will be mimetic fights. And uh, even in, in another book, Tocqueville recognized, interestingly, the French Revolution didn't start when there was deprivation uh, very strongly, but it started when there was already a growing equality. Would you think it's justified when, we, when I would say your book is still a little bit uh, too much going with the left-wing illusion, there is an easy way out, or did I not read your book carefully in this regard? No, th I'm glad you asked me that, uh, because it's an important point. Um, I feel that a lot of left-wing critiques of neoliberalism do not really transcend uh, a certain banal economism. They remain stuck at the level of redistribution. Um, which is really restating the problem. It doesn't actually solve this problem of um, mimetic violence, of mimetic rivalry. In, 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 I mean, this is a, a deeper question than we can go into yeah. at this point, but equality is a highly problematic idea. 
Obviously, its roots are in Christianity. But there, it's very clear that equality in the eyes of God, the pursuit of equality through some other means, through material prosperity, which has been the case in the last three decades, is going to unleash all kinds of mimetic rivalries, which is what we've also seen, uh, and conflicts, and of course, uh, exponential rise in feelings of envy, resentment, and, and, and all of these uh, emotions. So we need to really think about equality differently. Uh, we need to look at pre-modern social formations that without ever compromising on some basic ideas, the dignity of the human person, which are all there, which, is, which are enshrined in practically every religion. Uh, by the way, I mean, I think uh, the Buddha himself, uh, when, he, when he raises the question of equality, for him, equality is something that is to define through the fact of suffering, that all sentient beings suffer. And that creates, that is really the, 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 the base of equality. And the awareness that all living beings suffer, and therefore one needs to feel, feel compassion for them, is in, in a way you know, the, the basis of his critique of the sacrificial systems of his own time and so on. Anyway, that's a, that's a digression. But this notion that we have to address equality through heavier taxation, through better redistribution, really does not go to the core of the problem, mm -hmm. which is that our modern societies are premised on values that were always held in great suspicion, suspicion by the religions and philosophies of the past. Competition, vanity, mimesis. And that, as long as those things are thrive or are even given a great value, a, are credited with moral value, then the problem will continue to reproduce itself. Mm -hmm. We saw that also in, 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 in socialist societies or communist societies mm -hmm. where, where equality was imposed mm -hmm. and, 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 and what happened there. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I, I hope I don't come across in this book, although you just said I do. As it's, it's mixed. It's, yes, I think it's important to critique neoliberalism not only for entrenching, for producing outcomes that are manifestly unequal, First of all, promoting equality, promoting a pursuit of universal prosperity, but then rigging the game in the way that there is extreme inequality. Mm -hmm. we, have to, we have to definitely engage in that critique, but ha one has to go deeper than that and critique neoliberalism from a, let's, for want of a better word, from an ethical perspective. Mm -hmm. And to say that the values it cherishes, above all of competition, really undercuts uh, the basis of human societies, the social bonds, solidarities, networks that have been essential to, to human societies for, for centuries and centuries. Okay, maybe uh, not the last question, but <laughs> a question before the last question. I mean, many of us are really concerned, or the whole world is concerned, uh, because of jihadist uh, terrorist attacks. So some scholars, also some among us, now go into archives and they come up with a hadith and said, well, here it is, that explains everything. You write in your book to think that some obscure hadith or some verse in the Quran explains jihadism, doesn't understand the problem at all. And you draw on emulation between the West and the jihadists. I think that would be very important when you explore that a little bit. Well, that's, that's, a, that's a very important theme in the book, and it's not just about um, terrorism. It's not just about the mimetic tendencies within international terrorism, but it's also about nationalism. I argue that Zionism, political Islam, Hindu nationalism, that they all emerge 
out of a process of, of mimesis. That in, in many cases, I mean, it's, it's, it's fascinating that Hindu nationalism, for instance, reproduces, takes um, all the stereotypes about Hindus, that they are weak, they're cowardly, they're effeminate. Uh, it, it embraces them. And even when it's denouncing Islam, when, even when it's denouncing Muslims, it envies Islam for its apparent strength, for its apparent unity, and wants to imitate those aspects. So I don't think we will understand much of modern ideologies if we don't understand how Zionism emerges out of anti-Semitism, how Hindu nationalism emerges out of colonial stereotypes about, about Hindus. Likewise, with many um, <coughs> ideologies of extremism, of, of, of violence, uh, of anarchist violence, that they have always derived their identity from what they are opposed to. And without that, the whole project will, 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 will collapse. So I've, I show that in the various remarks to take only one instance, um, Osama bin Laden makes. He's very consciously talking about uh, mimesis, that you do this, we do this. Uh, you do this, we are going to do that. It's very, very apparent. Um, you dress our people in, in orange jumpsuits and send them to Guantanamo. Uh, this is not bin Laden, but this is other people we are going to dress them up in orange suits and behead them in, 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 in public. So this is really a case of escalation to the extremes, mm -hmm. of mimesis gone mad, mm -hmm. or gone pathological on a, on a, on a, on a global scale. Mm -hmm. And again, I mean, there are you know, other, other examples that come to mind. But this is where we should really locate the sources of, of much violence today, um, that uh, you know, trying to understand it through some theology or scripture is again, I mean, just intellectually, uh, it's just really, really deadening. Uh, it's, it's a total impasse that we find ourselves in when we try to do that. Uh, we, we can't understand any of these phenomena. I mean, can one find sanction for violence in, in, in any Buddhist scripture? Uh, maybe somewhere in, in, somewhere in some Tibetan tradition there is some, some sanction. But does that explain why the Thai monks are ethnic cleansers, uh, which is a different tradition of Buddhism. This is a fool's game, really. Mm -hmm. um, so I think we really should pay more attention to, to the Girarian concept of, mm -hmm. of mimesis here. Uh, one sentence in, in your book uh, comes very close to Girard's apocalyptic vision. So you write, the two ways in which humankind can self-destruct civil war on a global scale or destruction of the natural environment are rapidly converging. So this sentence is summarizing the, uh, the introduction of Shirar's book on Clausewitz. So uh, some of the reviews that uh, reacted already on your book said, well, Bankai Mishra shows us the mess we are in. He shows us the Voltairean neoliberalism, and he shows us the Rousseauian nationalism and resentment. And so what, what now? Many refer to the interesting sentence that concludes your book. Uh, the conclusion of your book, uh, in, the, in the conclusion of your book, you write that we need some truly transformative thinking. So it ends, some of the reviewers said, well, uh, <laughs> what does that mean? I mean, if, if uh, one uh, reads your book more carefully, you have uh, very important little hints to important religious traditions. Of course, I myself, as a Catholic theologian, was very happy when you write in the book that the most convincing and influential public intellectual today, Pope Francis, is not an agent of reason and progress, so the, this dialectic, but you, you see uh, a hopeful sign in Pope Francis and especially in his encyclical Laudato Si. You refer to Gandhi, you refer to Simon Weil, you refer to Eric Vögelin, and Eric, you quote from Eric Vögelin, the new absoluteness of evil, however, is not 
introduced into the situation by a revolutionary. It's the reflex of the actual despiritualization of the society from which the revolutionary emerges. So you see the spiritual vacuum, the spiritual nihilism of our world, which creates these strange reactions. And so therefore, you would side a little bit with Fögelin also that we need some new uh, reflection on, on the religious traditions. So could you uh, tell us a little bit what probably the follow-up volume will be when you will tell us what truly transformative thinking means? No, it's difficult to explain that um, because I've grown up, I've spent most of my life in India and most of my adult life in a village where I'm surrounded by religious people. My parents, uh, who don't live in the village, are extremely religious people. Religious in the old sense, you know, for whom uh, the idea of transcendence is still alive, for whom the idea of a divine presence is, is palpable. This is not religion ap approached through intellectual means or, or through study or scholarship. Um, this is active faith practiced um, every day. And for me, this is not new in that sense. You know, this is not designed call for new thinking, but it does has alerted me, living surrounded by these people, to another relationship with the world, a non-instrumental one, with other human beings. And when I step out of that world, I am in a world that has been remade by our emphasis on science, on a particular kind of instrumental rationality. Um, and when I'm saying we need a transformational thinking, I think we need to, again, I mean, it sounds very vague, but I think we need to rediscover some of these older ways of being in the wider world. Mm -hmm. Um, because otherwise, you know, I think we are looking at, as I said, um, extensive devastation, which has already happened. Uh, the number of species that have gone extinct just in the last few decades. The kind of damage that has been inflicted on, on the natural environment and the kind of violence that has been committed in the last uh, two, 200 years or so. Um, that really, in a way, if we are going to escape this particular trap, then we really do have to return to the wisdom vouchsafed in many of our uh, religious traditions and, 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 and philosophies. You know, many, there have been hundreds of reviews of this book. And I'm very pleased to be here, you know, partly for this reason that not one of them, not one of them pointed to this element that you've just pointed out. Mm or point to the influence of Girard or, or you know, the particular religious traditions that I'm alluding to. Because intellectual life is almost entirely secularized. To speak of religion, to speak of spirituality there is to provoke embarrassment amongst large numbers of very sophisticated people. And that means that the whole discourse has been delegitimated. That people who are paid to think about the world, about how we go forward, have discarded a whole way of understanding our place in history, our place in the, in the wider world. So we are looking at a huge intellectual deficit apart from everything else, which as, as I feel as a writer that you know, I should help overcome. Mm -hmm. So bringing these figures into play, bringing these religious traditions, writing a book on the Buddha, writing about Gandhi, writing about Girard uh, indirectly, is my way of saying that these, these, these traditions are relevant. These traditions are even more relevant today because the old enlightenment is more or less dead. Mm -hmm. uh, a last question, because maybe that can help us also the challenge we are facing. Uh, all the religious traditions, and we can especially see it inside the Catholic Church, but in all the traditions. One of the things where, where we cannot go back is the gender issue. We cannot go back to a, to a patriarchal Christianity or Hinduism or whatever in some way. And you address again and again in your book male rage. So there is a male rage going on globally in all the traditions, 
Trump probably was also elected because of male rage. So sometimes I was thinking, would you recommend we have to go back to a complementary understanding of male and female? And uh, you quote Turnvater uh, Jan uh, in Germany, let men be manly, then women will be womanly. In other words, passive, soothing, and domestic. If you would uh, underwrite that, uh, you get probably in trouble with half of the audience here. <laughs> but on the other hand, there is male rage. Yeah. Uh, could you? Uh, Again, I mean, I think, you know, uh, 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 someone like Gandhi recognized um, that there was a deep crisis of masculinity within the modern world that had caused this exponential rise in, in, in violence and that created the cults of people like Napoleon. Uh, mass murderers came to be worshipped because of their apparent power and strength and ability to conquer, to manipulate millions of people. Having recognized that, um, he emphasized this notion of androgyny. Again, I mean, we need a lot of time to, to, to get into that. But to move away from these hardline distinctions of the kind Jan is emphasizing between the masculine and the feminine, which really, in a way, uh, especially for men, create an intolerable burden of freedom, of individuality. I mean, we see this in India today, that men are expected to move out of their rural environments to find a place for themselves in the wider world, to become free, to take on this responsibility of freedom, and of course also to tend for their families, uh, for the weaker ones in their families, which they have left at home. And this proves to be an impossible burden. And therefore, this male rage, which manifests itself in many cases in, in, in horrific violence against women, a lot of the violence against women in India we see today is precisely caused by these men who find this challenge of masculinity impossible to meet uh, and, 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 and therefore uh, unleash their frustration against weaker people around them, physically weaker people around them. So this particular pathology of modernity, I think, of wanting to achieve power and realizing that a lot of this power is achieved by achieving domination over others. This is something Gandhi identified very, very clearly, very precisely, and overturned the masculine feminine thing. By not retaliating, by remaining passive, uh, he gave virtue to that particular stance. At the same time, making it an active principle, making feminism an active uh, principle. So I think there, there is you know, a, a lot to be learned from you know, these particular, uh, and, and I completely agree with you that there is no going back. There cannot be any going back mm -hmm. uh, to the older patriarchal feudal systems where uh, women were, were oppressed. That in, in, in the world we live in, you know, one has to think again about these gender roles. Mm -hmm. I'm now not sure, you know, if you do it in TV, you have, uh, you get, uh, uh, you get some notes <laughs> how we are with the time. Uh, do we have five, ten minutes uh, just to give the audience a chance to ask? I have many more questions, but uh, they stone me already because I I've occupied <laughs> all your time. But maybe we can have ten more minutes uh, just for, for questions in the audience to Pankaj Misha. His treatment of the Vedic tradition in these lectures that he gave, can you comment on his treatment of the Vedic tradition? Yes, I mean, it's a, it's, I think I read that after that um, interview where I said that one ha doesn't have to um, you know, think about Christianity as the only religion where the notion of sacrifice is dealt with in this direct, direct manner that um, there are other religions which have also, um, in a way, made this their central preoccupation, most importantly, sacrifice. And I, I mean, I find that, I found that a very compelling, compelling account, um, I have to say. 
Um, I wish he had gone more into the role of sacrifice and mimetic rivalry. I feel that this is really an underexplored area in the Mahabharata, um, where um, I think uh, some of Girard's insights are absolutely scintillating if, if one brings his insights to that, um, to, that, to that particular text. And also, I think his own ideas about the Hindu tradition of, of sacrifice. Uh, Kalaso has a very interesting book, too, where he refers to, I think, um, Girard's book on sacrifice on this, that there will be, you know, I think uh, there are vast areas yet to be illuminated. Um, and I feel, you know, this is something that um, scholarship would find extremely rewarding. A little bit is in the book uh, that comes out on 1st of November. We will send you a, a copy of the book, Mimetic oh, Theory and World, and Relig uh, World Religions, where we had an Indian Hinduist, Hinduism specialist and also two Buddhist specialists who did a little bit more and showed roads where Shirar or Shiradian scholars should should go. Absolutely. Should, yeah. yeah, yeah. Especially the Buddhist critique of sacrifice yeah, yeah. Is, is, is is fascinating yeah, too. Yeah. yeah. I th I think Wolfgang, I may have to run because uh -huh, you have I have a run. flight. Uh, okay. Literally. <laughs> okay. So. Is there maybe one more question or? Yeah, just one. Okay. Just trying to go beyond the the age of rage. Um, and Gerber, sorry, um, I come from Mexico. Um, um, we talk about uh, global south, uh, the epistemologies of the south. Uh, have you some thoughts about the, how the, um, we can go beyond the anger and uh, hope, trying to rediscovering resistances of different peoples in the south as a new way of understanding the uh, humankind? Well. I mean, the global south is a is a is a large refers to a large area. But you know, I feel the in many ways the advantage is what I was talking about earlier. For many societies in the global south, is that they are not completely detached from their cultural and religious traditions. I can't say the same thing about China, where, as you know, there was a deliberate attempt to destroy everything from the past, and it succeeded catastrophically. Um, so China is, is, is really probably the most materialist, the most modern society today in, in some ways. You can't say that about India, where I feel there are enough resources there, uh, somehow still surviving, where many of these modern pathologies of rivalry, uh, of competition, are still kept at bay that some other notions, some other ways of being, um, some other ethical codes are still resisting those ideas. To give you a small example, and then I have to run, uh, there was a, a community two years ago, three years ago in, in, in India, which uh, were being given huge amounts of money by mining corporations to leave their forests and also this sacred mountain that they revere. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a sort of tribal community. And they were being offered relocation in a new urban setting, in modern flats and so on. Um, they fought and fought and fought um, in courts through various NGOs and corporations. And they finally won. And that, there are many, this is only one example. There are many such communities. And there, that was an example of how, for some people or some communities, some of these older notions that we now like to mock of attachment to a land, a particular tradition, a particular way of being, we won't make a lot of money selling leaves in the forest, but you know, there is a certain coherence to that particular economy that will be lost if you were to move to the urban areas. And many people just end up being beggars or exploited laborers in the modern economy. So that is moving to the urban areas is not progress for them. It is remaining closer to their mountains, to their forests. And that is a struggle many these peoples or communities are engaged in right now, where they are fighting the, these large, very powerful forces of modernity, whether it's mining corporations or the state that wants to dispossess them because it's in search of commodities or, or uh, something they can export. 
and I feel it's it's there that you know uh, uh, a kind of resistance still 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 exists. So in, in in many ways, to answer your question, many societies in the global south are still relatively privileged in having those resources. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, uh, I.